Hello everyone, today is Thursday, September 23rd, 2021, and this is the week and charts. So we're going to talk about, it. well, first of all, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, I'll have a plethora of things to say about that as soon as we get to the live charts. By the way, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Hold off on the individual stock picks until we get to the live charts, and I'll let you know what that is. And once you do, just ask about one stock at a time. So what are we going to focus on? Well, I want to focus more on doing the trading stuff. And as I've been saying recently, I've been more and more cognizant, especially over the past few years, but then even more so over the past couple of months on what I'm doing here and what would happen if you were like looking over my shoulder. So as far as trading stuff, what would happen if, if you were looking over my shoulder? I'm trying to be cognizant of what I'm doing, the emotions I'm going through, the ups, the downs, and things of that nature. And I'm going to share some of that with you tonight. And in my stock chart show, the producer called me up and said, can you talk about the psychological state of, of what do you do when the market has a downturn? And... I kind of scratched the surface a little bit there, and I didn't really get deep into the psychology, and maybe that'll come up a little bit tonight, but certainly in upcoming shows. And I'm going to rehash some of the things that I talked about in the stock chart show. And one one of the reasons, among amongst many, is obviously you're a different audience, but two, or, or another reason would be I want to get in, into the podcast. Anyway, so the bottom line is don't panic. I know, ha ha. And then I want to talk a little bit about crypto and a bunch of other stuff. Maybe just a plethora of things to talk about tonight. So let's just hop right into it. Obviously, before we do all that, we have to look at the disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Always have to sum it up. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen now. And then I uh, stole that from Greg Morris. So I've been talking about this trading stuff for a few months now. And Again, I'm really cognizant of what I'm doing and probably could be even more cognizant of these things. And by the way, not to beat the dead horse, but huh, no pun intended here. Um, one thing that I've done over the past several years, I did many, many years ago, as I said, a nausea and I quit. I don't know why, but I started in more recent years based on a Julia, Julia Cameron book. And I didn't complete the book. I only read the first few pages. And she said, every morning, wake up and write three handwritten pages. And that's that's been a godsend for me. And that helps me to be cognizant of all the trading stuff that I'm doing. And it's important, like I said a second ago, trade like somebody is watching, okay? You might want to dance like nobody is watching, but you want to trade like somebody is watching to hold yourself accountable for your actions. And as I've said recently, and, that, and by the way, so so when I am trading, I'm trying not, like if I can't talk out loud, like I'm talking to someone, and, and I guess if you're looking in the window, you probably think I'm an idiot or worse, but I'm like, okay, I'm getting in this position because of this, 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 my stop is gonna go here, my additional profit target is here and so on and so forth. And I do that all day long. And I think it's very important to be cognizant of what you're doing and again trade like somebody is watching now the goal with all this is to show you exactly what i do and, and as i've said quite a bit when i meet someone i tell them what i do they kind of go okay whatever and then if i get to know that person better as they see me like today unshaven <laughs> you know shorts socks like what exactly do you do and i try to explain it to them in all kinds of ways and try to explain technical analysis and i just say you know i just buy stuff that goes up and I sell stuff that goes down. So being cognizant of that, I think ARQQ is a good example. Now, I threw this one out in the Facebook group. And when I was catching up on the post, I noticed that John Ross had talked about it about uh, two or three days earlier. So kudos to John Ross, who is quickly becoming our IPO guru in the group. And I thank you, John, for pointing this one out. And I decided to violate my, which is now the $30 rule. It used to be $20 rule, and now it's $30 rule when it comes to IPOs. 
for the buy at B pattern, now I do have other patterns to trade higher price IPOs, but for the buy at B, ideally the IPO should be less than $20 a share, and usually as far as the cutoff for the low side, maybe five bucks a share, and a maximum now of 30 bucks a share. Well, this was a little bit more than 30 bucks, and it's just the way it's set up. It was below 30, but then it set up and was above 30, so I decided to give it a pass. Now, as I've said a thousand times before, with the buy at B pattern, you're obviously buying at B, which was A, B, C. Markets go from A to C. It's got to pass through B along the way and all the things we talk about with the, with the buy at B pattern. Plenty of videos in the members area, at least, on, on this pattern. But there is one rule. You don't just buy that new closing high on or after day five, which is pretty much the entire setup. You check to make sure A, it has plenty of range, and B, that it also exceeds, the close exceeds, or where it's about to close, exceeds the day one high, if the day one high is the high for the week. So, and I get asked a thousand questions. I know everybody who understands it, your eyes are glazing over. Everybody else is like, what the hell is he talking about? Let's just say real quick on December, or I'm sorry, September 8th, Let's say this high was up here above this high. Then we throw out the day one high. We don't worry about it anymore. Then the new closing high, believe it or not, would have been on this day here. Okay. And that would have been pretty damn cool to get in at 17 and ride to 40 something. But anyway, I got in pretty late. I got in right there. Next day, as you can see, has a little bit of a lap lower. I have a client that I work real closely with. And he was bitching at me. He was, why we have to buy these things so damn high? Bitch, 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 bitch. And while he was bitching, it reversed. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> and began to take off. And by the end of the day, or the middle of the day, I was able to sell half on the position and hope it was going to really take off and run a lot further. Unfortunately, it came back in and actually lost on the second half of the position. And... One thing that I did and regret on this trade, and this, you know, my my regrets and my emotions and all these other things that I face and deal with and the mistakes that I make, I think that's all important to just come out so you guys will feel more normal if you get emotional, if you make mistakes. And, and you know what? You do. I guarantee you, you do. But I think I was a little full of myself when it was up in the 40s, and I thought I was going to go to the moon, and I probably should have maybe peeled off a few more shares at 40 something a share. But anyway, it came back in. So in one account, I only ended up making $313. Well, it's better than the poke in the eye. That was over a couple of days. But don't feel too bad for me because I did maybe buy a few little warrants on it and maybe I took it in more than one account. <laughs> so... Anyway, I I could have done so much better. It's, it's It looks like I'm bragging here, but believe me, I'm kind of beating myself up. And that's the thing about this business is you always feel like you could do a lot better and you're never going to get it perfect. Now, again, I started talking about the SHTF, and this is a, a continuation and a bit of a rehash of some of the things that I did in my stock charts show. I need to figure out a way to make the little guy explode. Yeah. You guys remember airplane? <laughs> so the first thing you have to do is don't panic, breathe. I know, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> you come in, futures are off 60 points, and it's not looking pretty. You have to try to take a 30,000 foot view, okay? How bad is the market really bigger picture wise? And if we have time, I'll show you like the TFM 10% system. And it was a long, long, long ways away from that. Doesn't mean that you're not going to exit some of your longs. You're not going to sit around and wait for a sell cycle in the market. But you have to, again, breathe and take a 30,000 foot view. And this is a hard one for me. Try not to look at your eroding equity. I know. Haha. -ha. In one account, I lost. I'm almost ashamed to admit it. I lost nearly half of what I gained this year on that ugly, ugly open, or at least by midday. And here's the irony of it all. 
I was feeling really, really bad last day or so. And then one account that I treat more, not that I don't fire off a day trade in it every now and then, because I do, I'm guilty of that. But I treat it more as, I try to keep it more investment oriented, not that I don't trade, because I took the ARQQ trade in that account. But I try to like hang on as long as I can, very similar to the core trading service. And when things are going really well, I really question the intraday trading I do because it does take its toll on you. And I think I've aged about 10 years this week. <laughs> but anyway, you wanna try not to look at that eroding equity if you can. And if you do, just look at where you are and where you were and like i said in, in the the account that i try not to do too much incredibly active trading in because it's a cash account i was down but i looked at when you when you first log in it tells you where you are over the last couple of years and it's like well looks like i'm still doing pretty damn good and if i would just walk in and see that and not know that it was a little bit higher when i came in or a lot of it higher it would have really stressed me out. But try not to look at that eroding equity. I don't know. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> you have to enact a little bit of triage, okay? What stocks have exceeded your stops and you're forced to get out? And we'll talk a little bit about that in one second. Which ones are a long ways away from stopping you out? I think we have one in the portfolio that we got in last July. So we've been in over a year. And that one and a couple other ones, as you'll see in one minute, were a long, long ways from stopping out. Yeah, it sucks. Don't get me wrong. But there's nothing to do on those positions. And as you'll see in a minute, if you do panic and get out of everything so you feel pretty good about it, they might all just come right back. Now, I'm not saying throw caution to win. If you're stopped out, you're stopped out. This is the hard part. You have to ask if there's an opportunity in this, and it's hard. It's hard to, it, it, you're gonna have two emotions at one time. You're gonna have the emotions of, oh shit, I'm losing money. And then it's like, oh shit, this could be the, a wonderful opportunity here. And I'll talk about that in one second. Unfortunately, the ogre list, the opening gap reversal list that I look at every morning just really didn't have anything that looked like it was fantastic. Now, one thing I want to mention is on big gaps down, it's too late to hedge, okay? It's, it's, the damage is done. It's too late. And before I go much further, as I often preach, in theory, hedging sounds great. In reality, it's not. A hedge costs money, and it's a constant drain on your account. And you're not going to make a lot of money longer term if you always have some kind of hedge, like puts – eroding away in your account. That constant decay will kill you and you just can't do it. So don't think that you could you could hedge. I mean, there might be a case where if you're up some ridiculous amounts in a stock or if it shoots up some ridiculous amount during the day, maybe you can go in and buy a few puts on it because the normal retrace of the stock and, you know, ARQQ, I doubt they have puts on that. I didn't even look. I figured they didn't. But, you know, maybe when it's at 40-something dollars a share and you're in at half of that price or much, much lower at least, and you your stop is 10 points away, you can maybe think about a situation like that. But I would encourage you to really, really, really tread lightly. I don't want to talk out of both sides of my mouth. There might be a, a, a case every now and then where if something goes parabolic, you might want to you might want to hedge it a little bit or even better, just peel off a few shares if that happens as opposed to getting involved with that hedging business. Now, the other thing, is there a possibility of the mother of all opening gap reversals in the overall markets and in individual issues? So along the lines of triage, like I said earlier, we've got one open from last summer, a few from January, a one from January, one from last November, and those stops are a long ways away. And as you can see, the gains are pretty good in those positions, and there's nothing to do other, other than just grin and bear it. 
Now, you do have to, again, you can't throw caution to the wind. You do have to be willing to get out of the way. And I said, oh, I'm going to buy this stock. I bought a few hundred shares. It wasn't enough to really, really make a lot or lose a lot. And I just decided, well, what the hell? It's an IPO. Let's give it a shot. And again, I took a position size much smaller than normal just to have a position in it. And I paid for that, obviously. So my stop was here. So I got stopped out. It happens, okay? You have to be willing to clean up your portfolio because you don't know if it's going to keep going further. Here's the problem. Let's say you get out of something like this at 2550 and you check it a few days later it's at 30 or wherever. It really pisses you off. But how many times do you get out of something and it just keeps on imploding? I know I can't think of which stock it is, but I had a few recently that I got out of and they bounced a little bit right afterwards. But by the end of the day, they were down another 10 points. And believe me, if I'd have ridden it down another 10 points, and if memory serves, I had at least a thousand dollars. Thousand dollars, I wish. I had at least a thousand shares, uh, if not in one account over multiple accounts. But I, I think it was a very sizable position. And had I not exited it, I would have been down tens of thousands of dollars, or at least ten thousand dollars by the end of the day. And Maybe that's not a lot to you, but that's plenty enough money to me. Now, it is kind of frustrating. Like in this particular case, it turned right back around and went straight back up. But you can't ever forget that he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So make no bones about it. It sucks. Momentum trading often ends badly, but it's what you signed up for. I've talked about that ad nauseum. And I'm going to flesh it out and a really good example here in just one second you got to remind yourself that it's where the money is the only way to make real money is through capturing longer term trends like i said my account where i just do the trend following stuff as much as possible and just fire off an intraday trade just when i can't stand it and and one reason i, I don't do a whole lot of uh, intraday trading there is because it eats away at my cash balance, at my settled funds. And if I fire up three or four day trades, I might wipe out all my available equity and come in the next day. And even though I have the money in my account, it's not cleared, okay? And it adds up pretty quickly if you're doing a lot of day trades. But the real money is in the longer term trends. And and I I used to really, really preach against day trading. And Earlier this week, I was thinking, you know, maybe you start preaching against it again. And what I'm doing is intraday trading, like we talked about quite a bit, the Russian dolls, occasionally some ETFs or reverse ETFs and S&P futures. But I'm trying not to be glued to a screen all day. Today, I actually went on a bike ride for an hour. First time I left the office probably in a month. <laughs> so I'm trying to detach myself again and just put them on, forget about them and, and, and let them go. I know. Ha -ha. But the real money is in those longer term trends, as I've been saying quite a bit lately. I've been talking with a client, and it's kind of like, and he, he day trades way too much, but it's like he was looking at, he's telling me about these stocks he got in, a few of them from the Landry list recently, like INMD and all, and he's absolutely, pretty, absolutely printing money. And I think it's got him questioned in some of the intraday stuff too. So the real money is in those longer term trends. Now, I think this is a big one here. And this goes for crypto, this goes for name your market, okay? But the reason trend trading works is because sometimes it don't. <laughs> and if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, TASK, T-A-S-K, comes to mind, I think, was a really good TKO. And it's like whoever bought late in the game was probably aggravated because they got shaken out. And that's why the stock was able to go back up. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that one in one second. Now, the other thing you could do if you have to, okay, or if, God forbid, you come in and let's say your position gaps down way down here. Well, the damage is already done. So you could say, you know what? I'm in trouble here. Let me watch this market. And if it begins to drop any further, I'm going to get out. 
And you have to have an uncle point in mind, as I preach quite often. Go in and watch. I think I talk a lot about damage control in the Q&A. There's also in the members area, there's a lot of stuff on damage control. And I see a lot of questions that I get asked all the time. And that's two reasons. One, in case I get hit by a beer trip. And number two, so I don't have to keep saying the same thing over and over. And I know everybody's like, Dave, you beat the dead horse. But you'd be surprised at how many people, people who A, should know better, people who just don't want to hear certain things, and and people who aren't willing to go in and watch the videos because it's much easier just to ask me. I don't mind being asked, but the information's out there. And I want it out there, and again, in case I get hit by a beer truck. But anyway, it's in the members area, not to soft sell you on that. Everybody here is already a member, that's fine. Uh, anyway, so if it gets lower and starts to rally, you might actually be able to put in a hard stop, okay, at your uncle point or wherever that the case may be, and below the intraday low, and then hang on, and you might actually be able to hold that position until the end of the day. And if it, especially if it goes positive on the day, you might just have survived a trend knockout type of move. But make sure you do have a stop in place, and it probably should be a hard stop. Let's say this thing gaps down, begins to rally, you put in a hard stop, then you move on to the next thing that needs to be dealt with. You can't obsess over one stock, okay, while the shit is hitting the fan, and forget about six or seven other stocks, and then also forget about possible opportunities in all this, which would be similar to the opening gap reversal. So just real quick, this was Academy we put on way last summer. We sold half and then we've been trend following forever. And the point I was making here is, notice that there were plenty of corrections both in time and in price along the way, which test your patience and your emotional fortitude, right? And a knockout bar like this, and what did I just say earlier? The, wind, the reason trend following works is because sometimes it don't, okay? I bet the whole world was poo-pooing academy at this time. Oh, pandemic's over or whatever reason they, they gave for academy to go up. I didn't think about the pandemic when I bought it, but in hindsight, I think it was a pandemic play. People wanted some, people like, you know, F this, I'm tired of being inside. You know, now you know how I feel all the time. <laughs> I got out today, like, what's that bright ball in the sun? That, that's the sky, you know, what's that bright, shiny object? Anyway, but so far, so good. And during those slides, I'd be willing to bet a bunch of shorts piled on this market trying to catch a top, and they got squeezed out. People have said before, I don't know who specifically, but they said that trends exist as long as people fight them. And I never fully wrapped my head about, around that, but if you think about it, if shorts are fighting the trend and nervous Nelly Longs are bailing out and then come back into the market and shorts get squeezed out, then that could perpetuate the trend. And we had a little drawdown here, obviously, on a slide. By the way, kind of an opening gap reversal there, just kind of seeing that. That's kind of cool. Wasn't big enough to be tradable, but pretty cool. Now, as I said yesterday, if you do get stopped out up at 35 and you bought it down at 16 or thereabouts, you end up making $7,000 and that's on a 100K account, which obviously is 7%. 7% move on an account, that's a good move. And the stock itself, you made 113%. Now, Hopefully, a word we should never use in this business, but hopefully this thing continues to run and we stop out at a much, 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 much higher level. All trend trades eventually end badly. All trades eventually end badly. Now, if you're upset uh, at giving up some of those open profits, let's say it went down to 35, stop us out, and you made $7,000 and that pisses you off, I am I, I feel horrible about that. So please. Send me the money so you can feel better. And in 30 years of all of my speaking, no one has ever sent me a check when they felt bad about losing some open profits and made a lot of money on a trade. But please feel free to send me the money if it's pissing you off. 
Now, here's the hard part, and it's hard for me, believe me, because I'm like, oh, shit, oh, shit, oh, shit. And, well, I'm sure I'm, sure I'm going to get demonetized on this video, huh? <laughs> but the hard part is, while everything is kind of coming unglued, you have to ask yourself, are there any opportunities? And again, you want to look for something like an opening gap reversal. You've got, especially if it's it's like something that's in a strong, strong trend. And by the way, it's only opening gap reversals I like to play. Strong uptrends and a pullback or at worse, a, a drop, a gap down from all time highs. I'll trade those too. But look for that gap lower and then look for a reversal. And that's the opening gap reversal or as ogres as one of you guys calls them. I forget who names, who's named what, but anyway. Now, I was a little hesitant to show this, especially my Trading Simplified show, because s and Futures, I have a love-hate relationship with them. As when, when a friend of mine joked up here, he once joked, he goes, yeah, you love them, because I said that once. He goes, yeah, you love them, they hate your account. And I do really well on S&Ps for a while, and then I get chewed up. And if I could figure out how not, how not to get chewed up, you never see my fat ass again. And as I've said, ad nauseum, one of you guys was asking me a whole bunch of questions about E-minis. And I think you thought I was being a little aloof. And the reality, it is, reality is they're very, very tough to trade. I seem to be able to do okay, though, when the market is kind of making a route. In other words, just kind of going in one direction. And the morning of the slide, I came in. And I'm like, you know what? This thing looks like it's going to keep on sliding. So I shorted. And I put in a trailing stop and I work out with a couple of friends now. And I went off to their little makeshift gym and I got stopped by the time I was, got back to the office, I was stopped out at a small game, then in the poke in the eye. Now, it did look like we were gonna have the mother of all opening gap reversals. So I figured it was worth a stab, went in, immediately got stopped out for a loss. When the market began to make a route lower, I went short again. And what did I say earlier? Buy stuff that goes up, sell stuff that goes sell stuff that goes down. And I wasn't necessarily trying to hedge my other bets, but I was like, you know what? This thing is sliding. Let me put on some some short futures. This way, at least if the market continues to implode, I'll make a little bit money on the downside, and that might help to offset the money I'm losing on the long side. And then I through trailing stops and profit targets, I ended up covering down about 30 points lower, at least on the remainder of them. And 30 points is not a bad move in the future just for what it's worth. Now, I do have a pattern I call race to the finish. And especially on a day like the slide, I guess that was Monday, right? My, my days are all messed up. But on a day like Monday, the market is so oversold and everybody is just selling, 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 selling. Well, the shorts have to cover and the shorts run for cover, no pun intended, as soon as the market begins to rally a little bit, especially late in the day. And I haven't fleshed it out fully yet, but if you pay attention to the last... I'd say 10 minutes or so of the market start, about 15 minutes before the close, if you have the luxury of doing this, pay attention to the futures and see what they do for the last 15 minutes, especially the last 10 minutes. And a lot of times you can catch a, a little pop going into the close and your risk can be fairly, fairly tight, maybe the bottom of the bar that you're getting in on, okay? But anyway, I ended up getting out covering shortly after the close and made a little bit on that, maybe 15, 20 points, better than poking the eye. So I'm not showing you this to brag, I'm just showing you that sometimes, especially if the market makes a bit of a rout, you can make a little bit of money on the short side. So I had an okay trade, I made a loss, had a loss I should say, I guess I made that loss, made a little on the, on the downside again, 20 points plus 30 points, and then one trade, 20 points, same trade, 10 points lower, and then a little, little run into the close, again, 15 to 20 points there. So better than the Pokemon eye. So that was pretty good. So there might be an opportunity, even opening gap reversal. I did lose money. I think I lost money overall chasing the index shares because the problem is the gap is so big to the downside, it's like what's left in those shares. But if it does look like you're gonna have a route lower, 
yes, take a look at the index shares, and yes, take a look, obviously, at the futures. Now, I want to show you, not that you want to throw caution to the wind, but like I said earlier, you want to just look at where your stops are, especially on your longer-term trend-following positions. Remember, we start off with a swing trade, and God willing, we end up with this longer-term trade, this free-rolling trade, so to speak. And that has a lot of open risk to it, but it also has open and hopefully unlimited gains. And I know you, you guys are probably sick of me talking about it, but we stopped out of one early this year for a 500% gain. And that was like a 24% or 23%, I forget exactly how much, close to 25%, somewhere between 20 and 25% gain in the overall portfolio, 20 something thousand dollars on a 100k account on the position sizing with only a two percent risk so that's a 25 to one reward people are like well dave let's just trade for a two to one or four to one or five to one well you don't know that going in and in fact you're likely let's say you're trading for five to one well you're five times more likely to get stopped out than you are to make that five to one gain but anyway, getting back to the service. So before the slide on Friday, we had open profits, counting some swing trades, some closed swing trades, okay? So open profits were what, 28,594, and you got one, two, three, four, you got five swing trades, so that's $5,000 that were closed out on this particular day. But we tracked the entire position. But anyway, 28,594, on Friday going into close, or right after the close, feeling pretty good about everything, life is good. Let's go have a fun weekend, right? Now, after Monday, the portfolio dropped to 24,691, but you have to count in the $1,000 that got stopped out on DATS so we can compare apples to apples. So that was ugly, but nothing stopped out in the portfolio. Now, that's not always the case. There will be days where you get cleaned out, okay? But luckily, that was not one of them. Now, here's what we look like today. And again, we had that $1,000 back. 27,642 which is not quite 28K if you did the math. So it's not quite a do-over, but you can do it. So hope, and I never should say that word, but I say it, right? But hopefully we will exceed the pre-slide or whatever you want to call it, but we'll exceed that by a very large margin and that'll show you that you just follow the plan i can't guarantee you this will always work i do see a lot of people get a little nervous and go 100 percent cash i think if you are to make any real money longer term if you go back and look at that that aso chart for instance there were plenty of times where you could have justified exiting that stock. And then you could maybe when the market's imploding on a Monday, like we had this week, you're thinking, you know what? This is, I'm getting an ulcer. I can't stand it. I'm just going to have to get out of everything. Well, you're going to be very disappointed if you do that. Not every time. Obviously, once or twice, you're going to be right. But longer term, I guarantee you, you're going to exit some really good trades. Now, this is not to say throw caution to the wind. And I would never throw anybody in the bus. But many years ago, there was someone trading a little bit different methodology than mine, but it did involve technical analysis. And they were absolutely printing money. This was in 99. And I remember in 2000, when the market began to implode, one of its stocks in particular was down 50 bucks. And I'm like, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I can't lose my position. It's like, so you're going to give it, you're going to let it slide 50 points against you? That's a little bit, well, even ludicrous would say that's ludicrous, right? <laughs> but that's crazy. Now, 
if you look at some of the stops in here, yeah, they're pretty wide, but they're not 50 points away, okay? Now, shifting gears, someone tried out the trading service, and within a couple of months, they said, I'm not cut out for trading. Well, let's take a look at what happened. So they joined a trading service on this day, and then they quit the trading service on this day. And he was probably thinking, this is the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. Now, you can look at the archives of this, by the way, davelander.com slash archives. And after he told me that he's not cut out for trading and he, he lost money, he said, I lost money on everything. It's like, okay, well, let's go look at that. Well, we had a decent run, and this is not counting existing positions. This is just positions that were open and closed two or three weeks prior to him joining. I think maybe three and a half weeks, if memory serves. You can look at the archives to see. And then these are new positions since he joined. And I don't know if he held on to any of those positions, but I marked those to market earlier today. And this is where he would be. He'd still be underwater, but like Bella, what's his name, Corolla? Maybe you could do it. Maybe, maybe it would turn out to be okay, but you can see what happened. His timing turned out to be pretty bad. Now, he did start in May, and as you know, summers can suck, okay? But that doesn't mean you shouldn't trade in summers, okay? Our biggest winner in the portfolio, when did it trigger? Last July or last June? Last July, I think. So we wouldn't have that stock had we took, taken the summer off. And that's that's one of the problems of trend following. You must be present to win. So obviously he saw this at some of its worst, but you got to remember he didn't get stopped out of everything, or we didn't stop out of everything during that period. We had existing longer term positions that were doing okay, and I think the CPE, like I said, I want to talk about it anymore. Here I am again. The CPE stopped out for a 500% gain, so. If you were just kind of looking at it from, let's say you weren't actually in the market, right? Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. But if you were looking at it like that, you'd say, oh, well, yeah, it didn't do too good over the summer. And then this guy didn't do anything for 49 days. So there was no there was no setups for four weeks and then 49 days triggered a trigger. And I'll get to that in just one second. But you're thinking, okay, well, this little period sucks, but stopping out of a 500% gain, that, that was pretty good. So that's 22,000. That's, no, what, is it, what did I say earlier? $24,000 or so. Anyway, you have, to, you have to give it some time. And you have to stick with it and you have to follow the plan and all of those things I preach. Now, I'm reading a book called Charlie D right now. It's pretty good. And the guy who wrote it, I guess it's the guy who wrote it, was saying Charlie D thought everybody could, anybody in the world could trade. And they kind of made fun of Charlie D because of that. But I'm, you know, Big Dave is, is the same way. I think that anyone can trade, okay? Successfully, that is, of course. And then last minute, right before going live, I thought, well, let me just throw a little caveat in there so they don't make fun of me like they make fun of or make fun of uh, Charlie D, provided that they really want to. A lot of people would rather be right than make money. And um, I'll mention that in just one second. Get a little ahead of myself. But what you could do if you do want to be successful is trade at a size that's nearly meaningless. And of course, before you even do that, Paper trade, prove that you could do it. If you can't do it with on paper, then you can't do it. And I, as I've said before, I've never met an, uns an, un an unsuccessful paper trader. Well, I met one guy once. How long have you traded? Two weeks. Okay, that, that doesn't count. You want to give yourself time. You must experience a few momentum cycles when it's when the market's hot, when it's cold, it's lukewarm. I think it was Brian Gelber. 
if memory serves, once said, three months a year, you're so hot as a trader, you can't sleep at night, you're just printing money. Three months out of a year, you're cold, you're cold as hell. Cold as hell, that doesn't make sense, right? Um, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> you're cold as ice, you're cold, you can't hit the side of the barn. And then the other six months of the year, you kind of grind it out, make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little, make a little, lose a little, wondering if you're ever gonna make any money. And for momentum trading, this usually takes around six months. I normally say six to eight months and occasionally a little longer, okay? So this gentleman started in May and I'm not just picking on, on him. There were, I've seen a few people recently like i wasn't impressed i i looked at it for two weeks i wasn't impressed it's like well okay <laughs> you know I, I i'm not i'm not that i'm not great there's two weeks here or there where i'm not that great sometimes longer but a good momentum cycle usually takes around six months and by the way this guy may or may not continue to trade i have to follow up with him because I told him I would and, and would try to help him in any way I can, because I do believe anybody could be successful. I really do. But the worst thing could have happened to this guy was he could have came in three or four weeks earlier and made money. Well, Dave, how can making money be a bad thing? Well, it kind of goes to your head and you kind of think that maybe it's always going to be like this. And one of the few things I remember from my MBA days and I don't think it was in a course. It was from one of the teachers that, that was I was good friends with that wasn't my teacher. But anyway, that's kind of a long story. He's the guy that tells a story about if Dave, if Dave heard that intravenous drug use was on the rise, he would buy needles. But anyway, he talked about permanent income hypothesis. And that makes that is when you think that what you just made, well, you were always going to make that much money. And as I've said a thousand times, I know I'm beating a dead horse, but I've had people quit jobs and quit businesses because they think they're making this FU money and they actually do just that, <laughs> tell a boss just that. And I, I strongly urge them not to, you know, keep the job if, if at all possible. You don't have to sit here all day like me. You can just take the swing trades and then hang on to them longer term. And again, that's where the money is. You have to learn how not to care. I know, yeah, right. I was thinking earlier, as I often joke, I'm very emotional. I cry like a schoolgirl when I'm forced to watch a Nicholas Sparks movie. <laughs> you know, I'm very, very emotional. I, a few weeks back, I, I thought I had uh, a buddy of mine had COVID, or probably a couple of months back now, and I already had COVID and I had the vaccine, or whatever that's worth. <laughs> but I digress. And the day after, or two days after I was exposed, I had a scratchy throat. Well, I also, the day before I was exposed, I also screamed a lot in frustration. And one thing about COVID, I don't know, if, for those who haven't had it, you might not know this, but for those who've had it, I'm wondering if you agree with me. If you had it, when you when it first comes on, I couldn't understand these people just exposing all these other people, knowing that they're not feeling 100%. But you go through a denial, even after I was diagnosed, or whatever you call it, knew that I contracted it, tested positive, I went through a bit of a denial phase, like, I'm fine, you know? Anyway, long story endless, it was just a sore throat. <laughs> from screaming too much. But anyway, again, I think that if you want to, you can do it. And I could certainly do a lot better if I followed my plan a little bit better and if I documented everything as much as I said you should. I mean, I'm probably three or four days behind on equity tracking other than looking at it in my, my screen all day long. Now, just shifting gears real quick, I'm in my stock chart show they're they're reformatting it to make it a little bit more like um i don't know how to explain it but like a a network show or something where you would have where you have different segments and on i'm gonna have a money management segment one of the first things i want to cover is the question i've received in various forms throughout the years 
is your money management psychological or statistical? So I'm gonna flesh this out a little bit more next week, but I thought I'd get ahead of that. And the answer to that, as I've said many times, is yes. Now, not to go all freshman psychology on you, but I think Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of best exemplifies this. Oh, hang on, I gotta fix this. There's something missing on here. Hang on one second, give me a second. Okay, here we go. All right, there it is. <laughs> to those of you who did not, didn't have freshman psychology, down towards the bottom of the list are things you need to survive. You need some, some air, you're gonna need some food, you need some water, and then you're gonna need some shelter. And it kind of goes up from there. You can't reach the self-actualization until your basic needs are covered and your safety and then you you have a loved one and belonging and so on and so forth well again not to go on freshman psychology on you but we have this psychological need for instant gratification as I often say we live in this so-called microwave society and i've always kind of got the gist of that saying until, and I know I have first world problems, believe me, so don't feel too sorry for me, until we moved into this brand new house and we really didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about the appliances other than the fridge and the stove, especially the stove because we cook a lot. But we didn't think about like the microwave and dishwasher, things like that, on things of that nature. And our microwave sucks and we probably spent I don't I don't even know what I, I don't want to know what we spent on it. This thing sucks so bad. I kind of I hate to use the word Karen because there's some Karen's that I like. <laughs> but I actually went on Amazon and left a bad review, even though we didn't even get it on Amazon. It sucks so bad. But it uh you bite it to something, it's it's hot on one side and cold on the other, and in general, it's the slowest microwave in the world. So I know first world problems. But we have this immediate need for gratification. And when, in these trades, I just showed you that little IPO trade in and out, two days. Yay, you know, that's fantastic, okay? Well, that's that really fills a need, okay? And I, I put a little bit of money in my accounts on that, and that's better than a poke in the eye, and that makes me feel kind of good shorter term. And again, not to go all fresh with psychology on you, but it covers some of those lower end needs. But the real money, as I've been alluding to all night, is in that trend trade portion, is in getting that 500% gain that I can't stop talking about. <laughs> but that kind of, it not only it not only puts you further up the, the ladder, because that gives you some security, or you could buy some security with that, right? Or some love, and you could maybe buy some love with that. I don't know, that's, I'm half kidding. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> But it, as you can see, it, it does help you to reach that, that longer-term self-actualization type of, of need and, and desire and all. So I think the money management does both. And then somebody earlier this week was asking me, and I think a few of you guys have noodled with this, and you can't, you can't boil it down to statistics. The question was, and I get this a lot. What if you kept 100% of your positions and didn't take the swing trade portion? Well, on, obviously on that $25,000 gain, or what is it? It keeps getting bigger, right? Every time I say it, but let's use 25 for round numbers. It was close to that, okay? Well, obviously if you took, you've kept the whole position, you would have made $50,000, okay? Well, that right there tells you you'd do much better. But before you get too excited, remember, you got to think of it from kind of a bigger picture view. And just like I said earlier, let's say, oh, I got this model where I'm going to I'm going to risk one dollar and I'm going to make five. OK, you know, the risk is the R to R is the, you know, it's the pirate's favorite money management. R's, you know, but it's uh, <laughs> the. You're, you're five times more likely to lose on that trade than you are to win. And I'll have to do the math to see if it works out, but it probably doesn't work out if you're losing five times for every time you win. I doubt you'll even win that much. Anyway, I think the psychological statistical by taking the swing trade and then hanging on for the longer term piece 
fills both of those needs, okay, and fills the psychological needs especially. But I think that just taking a bigger picture view and kind of looking down on it, if you did keep that full position, you would get stopped out a lot at a full position and you'd never get that thousand dollar gain a one percent gain on a hundred thousand dollars on your swing trade account so that's for instance ran up hit the eye fatigue came back down and stopped out so you made a thousand dollars on a trade makes you feel pretty good makes your account a little bit bigger okay but otherwise following the system if you'd had a hundred percent on you would have actually lost on a trade that in my eyes should have been a winning trade now just real quick about two weeks ago, I did a presentation called Before the Bomb Blows Up. And the reason I said that is people don't call me when the market's making all-time highs and say, Dave, what do you think about the market? What should I watch out for? They wait until they're down 30 or 40 or 50 percent and then ask me what to do. So I said, you know what? I'm going to get ahead of this. I'm going to do a presentation on market timing. And you should be able to find it on my website. You might have to be a free member. Just sign up for a free membership. And then you could you could find find it you should be able to find it on recent videos and columns. Anyway, but I did the presentation on market timing, or you can find it on YouTube. YouTube YouTube slash C slash Dave Landry, and it's one of the videos that I liked. But ironically, the market topped out about a week later. And not to go all Sun Tzu on you, but in times of peace, prepare for war. Like I said yesterday, it's kind of ironic. And speaking of Chinese generals, General Cho was allergic to chicken. So when we get to the charts, we'll take a take a look at the market timing real quick. Again, not to beat the dead horse, because I know I've talked about this a lot, but market timing is less about beating the market and more about not letting the market beat you. Avoiding the occasional 50% haircut is key. The old hedge fund adage comes to mind, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. Focus on the downside magnitude versus the mechanical systems in and of themselves, like the death cross, as I've talked about before. Really not a good market timing system, okay? I think longer term, you might beat the market by 4%. However, every now and then, <laughs> my, my show tunes voice just came out, however, <laughs> However, occasionally the market might drop 50 or 60% after something like a death cross or any other signal for that matter. Just real quick, this is a slide I've showed many times before. These are the signals for the TFM 10% system. We'll take a look at that in just one second. You can see the last little slide in here during the pandemic from the signal to the bottom, the market lost nearly 30%. So, you're probably thinking, but Dave, it came back. Well, it did, but it won't always come back. That'll work until it don't. A lot of financial planners, not all of them, but a lot of them drink the Kool-Aid and they tell people, don't worry, it'll come back, okay? And some of these people, they tell it'll come back. They come crying to me when they're down 50%. And that's why I did that, that show. Just in case this market tanks, at least you know how to time the market, or at least he has some ideas. But what's fascinating is if you go in and look at this, you can see the market loses a lot of its value fairly often, a lot more than it should, okay, if it was normally distributed. In other words, if it adhered to statistics. And that's why, by the way, that's why I'm kind of saying that it's kind of hard to go in with your statistics with the money management unless you're kind of looking at something from a, okay, how likely is a one-time stop likely to get hit versus a five times that stop profit target so that that i think i don't want to say it could be quantified but i think it's safe to say you're five times more likely to get stopped out so that's the kind of thinking you kind of have to think about when it comes to statistics in the markets if the markets adhere to statistics easy for me to say then whoever had the best computers and or knew most and or knew most about the most about statistics would own the market Every major bull or bear market will have a signal. A couple of thoughts here real quick. Every signal won't turn into the big one, but Greg Morris once said, we treat all signals as it will become the big one. Before I even met Greg, I 
also believed in taking all signals seriously. And if you don't believe me, go back 25 years or so and look at all the commentary out on the internet that I've made. And I show a bow tie when it occurs. It might not turn into a top, but I treat it very seriously or any other market timing system. Again, he who fights and runs away, lives to fight another day. Now, you're, you need to be a little bit longer term in your market timing. I know some people that, that, that drill down to like a 60 minute chart and, and, and I, I admire that work and I enjoy reading their work. I know we got a couple of guys in the group really into doing that kind of work and that's fantastic because it will turn on that 60 before it turns on the daily and before it turns on the weekly and the monthly. But I would encourage you to also take a, a, a bigger picture view of the market and have something like the, the TFM 10% system, for instance, is a weekly system. Now I will pay attention to daily signals, but I won't drill down as much to a to an hourly unless we have a daily first, and then we can go in and and kind of look at the fractal nature of it and see that it did start for an hourly. As I often say, listen to the database for a heads up. I didn't see a plethora of shorts coming into this sell off, so I wasn't like oh, it's going to get ugly, guys. It just doesn't feel right. Other than the only thing I saw. And you can go in and watch all the all the by the way, I just updated the archives, so you can get them daylearner.com slash archives. You can go back a few weeks or a few months even, and you can see where I talked a lot about how the market wasn't firing on all eight cylinders, but I didn't I had no idea it was going to turn down. Now, sometimes you want to begin to nibble at a lot, nibble at some shorts if you got a plethora of shorts setting up and the market is losing steam. And I've said this ad nauseum, but 2007, market was making new highs, couldn't find a long to save my life, apologized to my clients and started recommending shorts. It doesn't always work that well though, but sometimes it can. Momentum will get hit fast and first and hard. So sometimes your portfolio will get whacked, and I've talked about this many times when I was running, this, is, this was hypothetical, wasn't real money, but when I was running 100, share portfolio of the top new highs momentum list type stocks it would get creamed three to five percent and the market was making new highs i'd be like what the hell and then a couple days later the market would tank and i think that any of you who've been trading for more than maybe a year in here maybe a little longer you've noticed that your portfolio gets whacked but the market made brand new highs what gives well that's momentum getting hit first of course you gotta allow yourself to stop out Now, just real quick, recently I said I'd be willing to bet that one of the next five stocks that I recommend in the trading service, that is, will turn into a big winner. And somebody said, Dave, you're getting a little cocky there. I was like, well, I'm not saying to be cocky. I'm saying it because we went 49 days trigger to trigger, and I think we're due for some winners. So here are the next five trades, at least the next three of them. A lit thousand dollar gain on a hundred K account plus 13%. I mean, that's that's a positive 13%. 503 open and counting. That's $1,000 that stopped out, as I said earlier, plus zero. Full disclosure, Big Dave might just have a little bit left over. I am a little lenient, like you saw on that um, ARQQ trade. It did get that one, did kind of get away with me because it's not a great example, but. I am a little lenient sometimes where I will let that second love go a little negative, especially if I hit that a profit target really quick and it comes right back in. Sometimes you get that second shakeout, kind of like one, two, three, one profit target, two shakeout, three big move out. But yeah, it's following the system mechanically, you would have stopped out of that. And then YME, YMM, my third trade. So far, it's in the hole, but it's not dead yet. I still think it has potential. So let's see what number four and number five do. And I hate to use the word hope, but I'm willing to bet that one of those would turn into a big winner. I've been talking a lot about patience. These are the 12 tickets, as I've been saying quite a bit. And go ahead and watch Les' presentation. And I just need to get around to starting the blog on this, but we're gonna do 12 trades maximum over the next 12 months. I could spend them all in one month or hold on to them, hold on to all of them, spend them last month. But I'm only got 12 trades to show. 
and we'll see how this works out. All right, let's jump into the charts real quick. I kind of ran long here. I realize that. But let me do, let's see if we can do. Uh, crypto is crypto might be heating up again. Let me just show you real quick. These ones in, in red or pink are ones that I'm long. And as you can see, most of these guys are just, they pulled back to tag the 30 EMA. And I don't have my new buys in here, but this one was probably around here. I'm looking to, let's see, has it hit it yet? I'm looking to, on this one, I'm looking to cash out of half. I'm not a super bull on crypto right now. I just ended up in a few pairs, mostly yesterday or day before, based on some patterns that I've seen. This one's a little unorthodox because it's a little kind of crazy, but it did pull back to the to the 30. This FTM, I've absolutely printed money on this thing, so I might have to leave it alone, but I like it because it, when this thing goes, as you can see, it goes. And my initial buys, I think, are way down there at 30 something cents. Ran it to like 180, stopped out, and it just seemed like it was worth a shot. But it's doing pretty good. So we'll see what happens. The thing to do is you could sort these by strength, as I often talk about. You can see they're up a little bit, but not a lot. So we're not in a rip roaring momentum market anymore. But when you start seeing 20 and 30 and 40 percent in here, and most of these are up a lot, you want to be trading them. If not, you're not in a momentum market. All right, let's shift gears, and I want to look at the overall market, and we'll get to your stock picks really quick. Oh, I did want to show you one more thing here. Now, like I said last week, I want my service to be seen as more than just a tip sheet, but we had some pretty good stocks on the Landry list. I know at least one of you guys is in IM, INMD doing really well. That's, uh, as I said earlier, I still have some shares on that one. Task. Now, but Dave, you said, you said not to buy Task as a position trade. It's like, yeah, well, what I said was it might be worthwhile as a day trade, like a Russian doll thing. And what's fascinating about this one is... For S and G's, I kept 100 shares, and it's actually taken off. So you don't need a ton of shares if you catch a good stock, and that's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not trying to brag, but I'm just kind of amazed when I looked at my account today and saw 1999, or at least one of the accounts, on this one trade. It made me feel pretty good, obviously. And we'll pull that one up in a second. I had some skin, too. Some skin in the game. All right, let's pop back out to the overall market and see what we can flash out. Let me just show you those two stocks real quick. This is skin. This was a pullback again in the Landry list. So far, so good there. And then this is task. And the reason that my Kunas just slipped out, you heard that task? This is task. <laughs> the reason that Trade file works, as I said earlier, is because sometimes it don't. You see this TKO bar here? That probably shook out a lot of people, and that cleared the way for this stock to trade higher. Obviously, I regret not, not recommending it on the service, but as I said then, your entry would be around 70, and a stop would have to be down here at 55 or lower. It just didn't seem like the risk to reward was worth it. However, you go, but Dave, you traded it. Well, I went in and took a little swing trade, I think on this day here, and just for S and G's, decided to take home 100 shares, and so far it's worked out fairly well. Knock on wood. Let's just take a look at the market real quick. What's amazing is, and you probably heard some excitement in my voice in the service tonight, we closed the gap, okay? It's like, this is the end of the world? No, it's not, <laughs> you know? Now, are we out of the woods? I don't think so. Okay. Am I interviewing myself? Yes. But I'm willing to say we close the gap. That's a major big deal. Okay. You could actually, and I was just watching one of Larry Williams' videos. He calls it, oops, I don't, oops, I don't want to, I want to make sure, I don't know if I have his pattern exactly right. I think it's like, you would it take out the high of a gap? It means it's, it's the hook is in and then it goes the other way. 
but I've always watched gaps for when they come right back in because this creates a vacuum in the market. A lot of people get shaken out and if it comes right back, they're forced to put up or shut up. Remember, we're just reading the psychology of the market and the emotions of the market at the same time trying to embrace our own. Take a look at the P's, look at that. Look at the, look at the P's, they're huge. Feel like tiny Elvis here, look at that. Close that gap, okay, like butter. I wouldn't rush out and buy them right now, except maybe intraday, but they look pretty good based on closing that gap. Now, longer term, you can see they're rolling over a little bit in here, okay? And same thing goes for the NASDAQ, but one or two more days of big, big days like that would put us back to new highs, and it'd certainly be a good thing. Take a look at the rest. Look at that, up nearly 2%, pretty massive day there. Not too far away from all-time highs again. It's kind of at an inflection point, or at least this wide and loose range, the moving averages, since they're in the middle of the range, kind of give you an inflection point to where one big down day here, it looks ugly, it's gonna break down below the space and that's gonna be a ton of overhead supply. One big up day, looks like it's gonna come up here and take out the top of the range. But there's no need to try to anticipate that, let it unfold and then capitalize, look to capitalize on it. Take a look at the energy, it's pretty amazing. It's all chopping all over the place and now, boom. Take it off nicely in here. I need a different sound for up. <laughs> but up two and a half percent and not that far away from all time highs. Now I wouldn't rush out and buy them, but that's certainly a positive development there. On the flip side though, metals and mining, not so good. Looks like the top remains in place there. Take a look at like the banks. They look like they were rolling over again. Had a bang up day today, up nearly 3%. Financials really look pretty ugly in here, but now they're going straight back up. I wouldn't rush out and buy them though, just yet. Could make a head and shoulders or some other form of top. But one or two big updates, you're back to new highs and then we don't worry about them for a while. Drugs, a little bit different story. Drugs have a bow tie to the downside. They're looking pretty ugly in here. But one more big update will put you above the moving averages and then you might wanna not be so bearish on them, but that looks a little ugly. So the point I'm trying to make, and believe it or not, I have one, is the market is still really mixed in here and obviously the ugliness that we've seen lately is of some concern, but today was a really good day. Let's see if we could string together a few of those days. Take a look at the semis, look at that, almost all time highs again, okay? After a little bit of spill, close the gap, almost a new highs. Always err on the side of the longer term trend, okay? Give the market sort of the benefit of the doubt, and so far we've survived. All right, let's take a look at some of your picks. R-E-K-R, R-E-K-R. Um, I'm gonna say no. So you're looking at like a transitional type of pattern. As you know, I, I like transitional patterns coming off of major, major, major lows, okay? I see what you're looking at, but I'm gonna pass, okay? If I was just seeing, and I'm, I went to cover up the chart with my, with my hand, which is kind of silly. Let's see if we can make this thing go. Well, if we can get rid of this trading back here, you know, let's say you were at at all time lows here and a big rally up, nice little retrace in here. Let's throw a moving averages in. Yeah, that was like a bow tie and all. It would look fantastic, fantastic. But when you back the chart way out, you're not coming off all time lows. Now, I know there's been some stocks in more recent times that have taken off. Some of these crazy momentum stocks get ran up by the Robin Hood crowd, the phone traders and such, come back in and then take off again. So that's something I haven't fully wrapped my head around, but for now, I'm gonna stick with my longer term story of transitional patterns off of major, major lows. Okay, um, this one this one looks like the big blue arrow is still pointing down on that one from where I sit, or I'm actually standing right now. You've got a ton of overhead supply. I'm not sure why, I hope I have this. Do you have the, uh, Sometimes we get a mixed signal here as far as the symbol. Is it RMO you were looking at? What's RMD? Maybe that was it. Sure you went RMD. RMD looks a little bit better. Only problem with RMD is it might be priced for perfection. It's also a, a, a low in volatility stock, so I'd pass on that one too. And it looks like it's lost quite a bit of steam in here. TWKX, 
TWKS. Yeah, that looks good. That looks good. That's uh, John. Yeah, John's our IPO guy. Um, a tiny bit deeper pullback would be nice, but you know what? I like it. I really do. I'm going to give you a high five on that one, John. Good job. We'll have to check the spread. It looks like it's got okay volume. Okay. Yeah, let's see. 26 to 34. It's a good run. Yeah, I like it. I like it a lot. I like it if it pulled back a little bit more, but uh, I think it's good. I really, and you know, here's the beauty of this particular stock is if it has a little bit of a rally, you get to new highs and new closing highs and an IPO can really take off. Yeah, put that one. I'm going to write that one down. That's, uh, that's a good looking stock. DWKS. You get a high five on that one for sure. Absolutely. C E R E Siri. No, I don't like the way it came back in. See how it came back in to where this prior little high came back in. It's also kind of wild and crazy. It hit this big old jump higher. I passed on that uh, based on the uh, my Kunis just slipped out again. Yeah, it's kind of, you know, it broke out and then it came all the way back in the way it broke out. I, I think I'd leave it alone. VTOL is the first thrust out of the base enough. All right, let's take a, take a look. Uh, initially, it looks pretty good. It's a little bit on the thin side. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think that looks pretty good, George. I mean, you came out the base. I really can't pick it apart too much, but it might be a little too thin. Um, and it did pull back quite a bit. One one thing, the majority of this move, or a big part of this move, was on this one bar here, but it did have a few wide range bars going in, pretty deep retrace. But I think it looks, I think it looks pretty good. It can be a little wide and loose. I think it would, I think I would pass, but I can't fault you on that one, okay? Because it did have a nice breakout, it did have a nice deep pullback, and a first pullback after a base is a good pattern, and I know you like those. So I'm going to say it's okay, but I'm going to pass on that one for those aforementioned reasons. You, 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 you. Um, uranium is such a crazy area. Sometimes I, I'm able to give it a little bit of a pass, but let's just say I didn't know anything, and I just saw this as a stock. I'd say, well, it's a little wide and loose. It's kind of got this act together. It's pulled back. It looks okay. I actually tried an ogre on this one, I think, a while back and failed miserably, truth be told. But I would prefer if it would have broken out past these prior peaks before pulling back. I hear you though, Lauren, this this looks pretty good over here, this little run here, this little pullback. But I just don't like the way it pulled back in below its prior peaks. URA would be an alternative, you say, let's see. Yeah, URA, if you had to pick one out of these two, I would go with the URA, that's ETF, but that's fine. Here's the thing, it's an ETF, it's got a HV of 51, okay? But yeah, I think that would be a better play. Um, let's say 26 and 22, give it like maybe a little bit less, maybe 26, 23, three points. But yeah, that looks good, Lauren, good, uh, good job on that. Any other ones? Going once, going twice. Well, while we're in an impasse, obviously I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. Looks like our numbers are getting better and better. I'm finally remembering to put the show out there. If you can't ever find a show, go to davelander.com slash webinar. It's going to probably be a webinar from six weeks ago. But register and it will put you in the latest webinar because the, the date on there is just a date that I put in. It has nothing to do with the actual webinar is. <laughs> Thanks, Dave, for the great class. All in caps. Wow, I've never got that uh, compliment all in caps like that. Thank you. I've gotten some all in caps compliments before, but they weren't flattering. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. All right, everybody have a great night. I guess I'll see most of you guys in Facebook tomorrow. Everybody else, have a great weekend if we don't talk again. Thank you so much.